What will that higher level be? Well, you can estimate it with computer models, sure, but you can also do it through other methods, including looking back at the effect CO2 had in the past. And these estimates show that for a doubling of CO2 concentrations, we should see a rise in global temperatures of between 2 and 4.5 degrees. Now that's all basic physics, but to see if this happens in practice, we need to go back over the geological record and answer the second question, what's the evidence CO2 has had an impact on global temperatures in the past? If basic physics is correct, then we should see a good correlation between temperatures and CO2 over the past 500 million years. Well, here's the data for temperatures, and here's the data for CO2 levels. Put them together, and you get a very clear... oh dear... Actually, no one expected to see a correlation between the two because, of course, we're missing the most important factor of them all, the sun. Well, they virtually ignore the sun as a factor of climate change. It, I mean, everybody knows that the sun is the main source of energy and it, it's only got a flicker and it has an effect on us. Tim Ball thinks he's talking about researchers here, but it's the climate science critics, the politicians, the bloggers and the amateurs who showcase this graph that completely ignores the role of the sun and it's the climate researchers who factor it in. Over the last 500 million years, solar output has been getting gradually stronger. Of course, on its own, it doesn't show any better correlation with global temperatures than carbon dioxide does on its own. But if the CO2 temperature link is correct, then when we factor in both CO2 and solar irradiance, which are the long-term drivers of climate, then we should get a very good correlation with global temperatures, and we do. And a third piece of evidence from our geological past are the so-called snowball earth conditions. Since the sun was much weaker than today during the Precambrian period, the cooled earth should have been almost entirely covered in ice, and it was several times. So what thawed it out? The only thing that changed during the snowball period was that CO2 levels rose dramatically through volcanic activity. The thawing of the planet fits perfectly with carbon dioxide's role as a powerful greenhouse gas. Over time, CO2 tends to get washed out of the atmosphere due to chemical weathering, becoming carbonates that fall to the sea floor and turn into carbonate rocks. But during Snowball Earth, for obvious reasons, that kind of weathering didn't happen, which is why CO2 would have accumulated in the atmosphere. And since those high levels of CO2 remained even after the Earth had thawed, the Earth kept warming until it became a hothouse, with coral reefs close to the poles. Yes, even with the sun about 6% weaker than it is today, but with carbon dioxide levels 25 times higher, the Earth was much hotter than today. This anomaly is our fourth piece of evidence that carbon dioxide is a powerful greenhouse gas. Over millions of years, carbon dioxide weathered out of the atmosphere, and as levels dropped, so did the temperature. The Earth became a snowball once again, and the process repeated itself. Carbon dioxide's role in regulating past temperature is so clear that CO2 has been called the Earth's thermostat. So when I hear the argument, the climate's always changed, and this is perfectly natural, and that the climate change going on now is perfectly natural, well, of course it is. There's absolutely no difference between the CO2 that's being added to the atmosphere now and the CO2 that was added to the atmosphere in the past. It's the same stuff, and its warming effect on the atmosphere is exactly the same. Coming to the more recent past, there's the evidence that higher levels of carbon dioxide helped end recent glaciations. Climatologists agree that the amount of forcing from the Earth's changing orbit, thought to be the initial trigger for deglaciation, had nowhere near enough energy to thaw ice covering a large portion of the planet. I covered this in my video, The 800-Year Lag Unraveled. So before you start claiming that CO2 only lags temperature changes, please take a look at the scientific research that I cite in that video. So we've now seen how basic physics tells us that increasing levels of CO2 should warm the Earth, and we've seen that this has been observed throughout the Phanerozoic, the last 500 million years, and we've seen how a hothouse Earth and the thawing of a frozen Earth are consistent with CO2 as a powerful greenhouse gas. So if it should happen in theory, and it has happened in practice, then there's no reason to suppose CO2 has reformed its behavior just because it comes from the burning of fossil fuels rather than volcanic activity. So is there any evidence that CO2 is causing global warming now? 
Back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, of course, scientists saw no reason why CO2 should magically change its properties, and they predicted that as CO2 levels rose and aerosol pollution cleared, we'd start to see warming, and that's exactly what's happened. Over the last 35 years, the atmosphere has been warming, melting ice sheets and glaciers. Of course, not all the extra heat we're getting goes into the atmosphere. Most of it goes into the ocean. And recent research shows that the deep oceans are absorbing a lot of the heat at the expense of the atmosphere. So while there's still a debate among climatologists about exactly how this extra heat is being distributed, there's no doubt that there is extra heat coming into the system, just as scientists predicted. 